This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So, Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. New activation and upfront payment for three-month plan required. Taxes and fees extra. Additional restrictions apply. See mintmobile.com for full terms. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. The low alcohol drink sector has been booming in the last few years. And in this episode, we really zoom in and focus on the drink kombucha. If you've never tried it before, maybe have a go. But you might want to after listening to this programme. So have you got a brew on the go right now? Yeah. Okay, cool. So the pack of these are right here. So they're all open air. So how long has this been in here? This has been here for a week. Just a week? Just a week, yeah. Goodness. You can see the scoby growing on the surface of the liquid. So that's a, a, it's called a pellicle. It's made out of cellulose and that's produced by the bacteria during the course of the fermentation. So a lot of people think it looks like a mushroom or a jellyfish. And most people would brew with this. They transfer this from batch to batch, but you can just use the liquid. Um, so yeah, that's essentially like a little colony of bacteria and yeast all living on top of the surface. The magic liquid we're looking at is kombucha. I know what you might be thinking, maybe it's a bit fatty. There are a lot of health claims associated with the drink. Maybe you've heard of it, but you might not quite know what it is or even what it tastes like. Well, we have two kombucha producer finalists in this year's BBC Food and Farming Awards. So we thought it would be a great time to look at this fizzy, acidic and slightly mocked drink. Us Brits haven't been as quick to embrace it as others like the US and Australia. Why is that? And what about the claims that it could be doing wonders for our health? Should we learn to embrace kombucha? I'm Jager Wise and welcome to The Food Programme. Let's start this week at Old Tree Brewery near Brighton, who are nominated for Best Drinks Producer in this year's awards. Hi, everyone. Hi, I'm, I'm Harry Tewksbury. I'm the head brewer at Old Tree Brewery. I'm Ty Ray Jones. I'm the managing director. I'm Thomas Daniel. I am the founder uh, of the company and I, I do a lot of events. Firstly, what is kombucha? Yeah, at its simplest, uh, kombucha is fermented tea. Um, so we take... A blend of psalm tea, Mm -hmm. which is a a black tea, and we do a blend of that and green tea, essential tea. And where's this tea come from? Uh, This tea is from India. You would steep this in water? Yeah, so yeah, you'd steep it as you would a normal tea, steep it in hot water, and then you sweeten it with sugar. And then you introduce the kombucha culture, uh, sometimes referred to as a SCOBY, which stands for Symbiotic Colony of Bacteria and Yeast. So that's just either a a solid cellulose block or a liquid culture. And you add that and then the yeast and the bacteria will ferment the sugar and the tea into the finished product. So it's quite straightforward then, the process. Yeah. You make make a cup of tea, you sweeten it. There you go. And you add your your scoby. You add your scoby and and you let it ferment in a warm place uh, for a week or two. And then, yeah, you bottle it. You can brew kombucha with the nutrients from other plants. You know, it originated from the areas where tea is is farmed and it's sort of spread around the world as people have passed the scoby on but we have done some experiments with oak and with mugwort and that's really interesting because the 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 tangy fruitiness that the kombucha culture creates is coming from those plants too so it's 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 exciting about the idea of like regional kombuchas using the native flora and wildlife so some of the organisms and some of the acids coming off this so, what, like acetic acid? Yeah, Are we there, getting... there would be a mixture of acids. There's yeah. primarily acetic acid, which is vinegar. Um, there's also gluconic acid, glucuronic acid, which are meant to be very sort of uh, healthy, detoxifying organic acids. And sometimes you get cultures with lactic acid as well, which is uh, common in other ferments. It has the sort of more sour sort of milk flavour. For someone who's never come across kombucha before, do you know any information about 
a bit the history of kombucha. Yeah. So you'll hear a lot of people refer to it as an ancient drink. The exact origins in terms of time and location are unknown. They've been lost to time. But they figure they're going to be somewhere in the China, Mongolia, Eastern Russia kind of areas where that originally started. The first documented, I think, um, mention of kombucha was from the 1800s in Russia, if I remember correctly. And that obviously, that was a in your home, in a jar. And that's how it continued for you know the next couple, couple hundred years. But the first commercial kombucha production in the UK that I know of was in the very early 2000s. It wasn't really until probably the last, I would say, five to six years when you've really seen an explosion in kombucha breweries, especially the last two or three. Um, I think lockdown actually pushed a lot of people into doing more kombucha and interesting kombucha grew a lot the last two or three years. Can we drink some stuff? Yes. Yeah. Let's, 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 excellent. Let's, let's. excellent. All right, so we could do this experimental one. Bramling Cross, yeah. which you probably know familiar well, with. Yeah. <laughs> British hop. For us, we sort of we started going down to some of our experiments, sort of the hop rabbit hole. And there are just so many hops. We got completely lost in all of the hops. Um, but we think this one provides a really interesting sort of flavor profile where you get sort of lots of really fruity flavors like blackberries and yeah. oranges. And, uh, and I'll just, um, can someone could grab the glasses there? So can, can someone talk, talk me through um, how to do an official kombucha tasting, please? <laughs> I, 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 I want to know what, what some of the flavors I should be looking for. Yeah. I'd say for a standard sort of unflavored kombucha, you're looking probably to have a little bit of acidity, so a bit of bite, but not vinegary. If, if it's gone to be vinegary, in our, in our estimation, that's too far. Yeah. You should be finding it to be a little bit of sweetness, but not too much. If it's really sweet, that's not quite right either. Again, but also you don't want it to be bone dry. So it's somewhere right in there that's ma- it kind of matches the sweetness and the sourness together. But it so depends on the tea that you use, because yeah. the tea itself, without even adding flavors, the tea itself makes a massive difference in the type of flavor you get. Yeah. So yeah. What's, what's the base of this? So this is a green tea. This one, no, this one's an experimental one. So instead of using <laughs> uh, conventional Camellia sinensis tea, which, of course, is usually grown abroad, we're experimenting with using more locally grown uh, herbs and things. So the, actual, the actual tea based is a hemp leaf tea. Um, so, yeah. so delicious. No, I'm good. I'm glad it's you like it. Fruity. It's very fruity, like, isn't it? I see what you mean about the combination between tart, sweet, mm-hmm. and yeah. fruity. It's a very delicate balance. Yes, so you kind of balance all those things, and, and, and usually in combining with the aroma, it creates a sort of whole new sort of journey of flavours. But it's not a simple drink either. It's quite, it's no. quite complicated. Yes. Um, but it, there's a complicated simplicity to it. Yes. <laughs> so, 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 so well, to there's, speak. There's also if, I, if, if I can do a peak food program. Yeah. Uh, so we know kombucha can be delicious, but it still remains a bit of a novelty in the UK. Why is that? I'm William Kendall. Um, I'm an organic farmer, um, entrepreneur and investor in food and drink businesses. William Kendall has run businesses that have become household names, like New Covent Garden Soup and Green and Black's Chocolate. He got into the UK kombucha market early on. Personally, I've been looking for drinks that are alternatives to alcohol for really the last 20 years, like a, like a lot of British drinkers, I think. And I invested in business that became LA Brewery about six years ago, and I'm chairman of it. OK, so c- could you tell me a little bit more about LA Brewery? The founder of it is someone called Louise Avery, and I met her through a mutual friend. Um, the mutual friend said, you've got to try Louise's kombucha, it's delicious. And I had tried kombucha over the years. I seem to remember originally my mother's friends brewing it in their airing cupboards and it tasting pretty disgusting, but, you know, therefore probably quite good for you. So I followed the advice, met Louise, uh, who was brewing it on a tiny scale in a little basement in, in Hackney and completely agreed. It was, I was bowled over by it. It was so delicious. So we um, invested in building her first brewery in Suffolk, where I live and farm. And we've now built a second, much bigger brewery. Um, and the business has grown from there. Can you talk about how the market in the UK has developed over the years since you've been involved? Well, it's certainly grown. I wouldn't say it's grown exponentially. I mean, when I first discovered Louise and, and what became LA Brewery, I thought it would grow very, very fast. Um, I have to say, I've been rather disappointed. I visit the States quite often. I've seen how explosive the growth has been there. I know it's slowed down, but it's slowed down at a very high volume. 
If you look at the range that you'll find in a typical supermarket or even in a bar of kombuchas, I assume that by now in the UK you would have, you know, a, a multiplicity of of, of flavours and kombucha drinks on the shelf. And for whatever reason, it's taking a lot longer. And I have to say, after thirty years in the food and drink industry, I'm I'm baffled as to why it is taking so long. Could you have a gander as to why? I, I think there's a there's quite a lot of prejudice against high quality non alcoholic drinks in certain areas of the of, of, of retail. I think you know the, the the traditional wine buyer, the traditional beer buyer. I'm talking about trade buyers. I'm not talking about consumers now. I think they they like the whole mystique and world of of, of alcohol. I think if you're a sommelier or in a in a in a good restaurant, you you love talking about about alcohol, about wines and how they're made. And I think that something that is non-alcoholic, which aspires to the same status, somehow is resented. And I think the people who are the gatekeepers to those sectors, for some reason in the UK, are very resistant. And I think they just don't know what to do. I mean, the market stats are very, very powerful, with over 50% of the British public saying they either don't drink anymore or they want to drink less. In, in a world where we are essentially overfed and overwatered, there aren't many business opportunities like that. And yet the um, slow growth and the reluctance to seize the opportunity, I'm, I, I have to say, I find baffling. Of course, you don't have to get your kombucha from a supermarket. Uh, hi, I'm Mark Ilan Abrahams. Um, we're in Bristol and I brew kombucha just for fun. And so we're just here having a look at some of the kombucha setup. I started brewing kombucha probably like a lot of people during the pandemic. It was one of, one of the little projects that I got involved with, so that's a, a few years ago now. So I've just boiled a bit of water in a little metal pan. I've just got three regular tea bags and what is it, 100 grams of plain white sugar. And I'm literally just adding hot water to tea bags and sugar. I wanted to brew kombucha perhaps a little bit unusually because I actually quite like the taste of it. So. I often really crave um, a drink that's like cold and fizzy and like a little bit sweet and quite sour and, and this I can make myself and to buy kombucha is kind of expensive. In there you can see that, re that, that at the top is the really thick new scoby and all in the bottom are some of the older ones so I can just pour it out into here, hold on. One of the things that I like about the process of making kombucha is to have like a little living food pet in my kitchen that I kind of tend to. Production of, of scobies is like a blessing and a curse thing, like having cuttings of plants or whatever. You've got lots of gifts that you can give to people, but then the curse aspect of it, it's like, you know, you're sort of like a vampire and the minute you've infected someone else with kombucha, they then produce a million scobies. Well, John looks as if he could do with a stiff drink, but I wonder if he would fancy a glass of this. It's called kombucha. It's a fungus tea made from a Manchurian mushroom. And just listen to some of the health claims that kombucha makes. Apparently, it can eliminate wrinkles and brown liver spots, prevent some types of cancer, help asthma, bronchitis and coughs, ease muscular aches and pains. That clip was from the really useful show on BBC One in 1996. Health is a major factor when people talk about kombucha. All kinds of health claims are made about it, everything from helping the immune system and weight loss to curing cancer. Often these are not made directly by the producers themselves, but by influencers, enthusiasts and journalists. So what does the latest research say about it? My name is Paul Cotter and I'm the head of food biosciences at Chalgusk. And Chalgusk is a Gaelic word for information and teaching. And we're the research wing of the Irish Department of Agriculture and Food. Actually, we run uh, the largest academic uh, DNA sequencing facility in the country. And we use that to study all sorts of different microbiomes or microbial communities uh, relating to gut health and other environments, but a big focus in our lab is the microbiomes of food and fermented foods in particular. 
I mean, the, the field of microbiome research has really evolved over the last 20 years as a consequence of new DNA-based approaches. Through DNA sequencing of essentially poo samples, we can see what microbes are there and what they're capable of doing. And that has spawned a, a huge focus on the gut microbiome and identified a number of associations uh, between particular types of microbes and different diseases, uh, IBS, colon cancer, IBD, and almost every disease you can imagine now has some sort of relationship with the gut microbiome. And so by extension, then, it makes a lot of sense where you might have a suboptimal microbiome to try to change it. And food is one of the most obvious ways to do that. If you look at a drink like kombucha and its chemical composition, potentially what parts of that drink could be good for you? Yeah, so there, there are quite a few. So there are lots of particular microorganisms in there. Um, so in kombucha, you typically find a lot of what I refer to as acetic acid bacteria and then a variety of different yeasts like Zygo, Saccharomyces, Decra and others. So those microorganisms directly might be contributing to health in different ways. They also will produce some metabolites or take the basic material. So a lot of kombucha is made from tea. So it will naturally contain phenolic compounds, which have health promoting capacity, but the microorganisms will metabolize them or, or carry out chemical reactions and change those phenolic compounds to others that are maybe even more active again. Kombucha has been associated with antioxidants, antihypertension, so lowering blood pressure effects. Um, and in, in particular, there's been a number of research uh, studies done over recent months and years relating to um, hypoglycemia and reducing blood glucose. And uh, in particular, that seems to be one of the stronger health claims related to at least some kombuchas. There is a lot of interest about kombucha and the word probiotic. First of all, could you explain what probiotic means? A probiotic is a strain for which there is real uh, clinical evidence associated with a particular health benefit. And so that's distinct from, for example, the strains that you generally find in fermented foods, whereby we think there are lots of microbes in there that can contribute to health, but the individual strains haven't been isolated and studied and been the focus of a specific clinical trial to confirm definitively what their health benefit is. Where I would like to think the research will go in years to come is that for particular versions of a kombucha or a milk kefir or a water kefir, or that there will be studies that will be done with strains from those particular foods that will definitively establish that they have health promoting potential and that those then would become probiotic fermented foods going forward. So it's interesting, isn't it? The very nature of the production of a drink like kombucha, which is very dependent on a, a completely wild environment. They are, it's open to the air. That wild environment does that make a difference when you're looking at the fermentation of these kind of foods yeah you're, you're really getting into the the nub of the the whole research field there now Jega, um, in that in terms of a kombucha i might make a one kombucha and you might make another and then the microbes that are present therein are likely to be different and so the challenge is how to get the right kombucha to the right person in that we know with some other fermented foods, for example, that there are certain milk kefirs that are good for controlling weight gain and others that are good for addressing anxiety. So I don't worry so much about um, weight gain because I, I run a lot, but I could probably do with help in terms of my anxiety from having to deal with 200 emails a day. So, but how do I make sure I get the, I get the right one? And I, unfortunately, as things stand, we can't do that. But um, but I don't want us to go to the to the extreme whereby we simplify the kombucha or other fermented foods to the extent where it's just one strain or two, where you're optimizing it with a view to mass producing it, but maybe losing some of the key original artisanal features. So what we're working towards is to try to strike a balance between both worlds where you more extensively study the kombucha, not only of the one that I have here but and the one that you have, but maybe the kombucha from... 40 different countries around the world to see how they differ, what's common between them all, which strains might be um, have the greatest health promoting potential. Uh, and ultimately, I guess I, maybe it's fanciful, but I envisage a time in the future whereby you almost have not quite a personalized kombucha, but a kombucha that's tailored for your specific needs. What do kombucha brewers like Old Tree Brewery claim about the health benefits of their drinks? 
And we try to be very careful about claims. We try to tell people that it tastes good. It you know, helps you feel good for whatever reason that might be. And that's the main reason to have kombucha. But it does have a, a huge health halo around it, for sure. The thing that actually does help and is very well researched with kombucha is the acids. The acids are actually really good. So acetic acid, which is what you would normally find in like an apple cider vinegar, has a lot of research behind it and is well, it is well proven to have good positive effects on your gut. We have such a strong relationship with tea in the UK. Is that helpful or, or harmful to uh, helpful, right? fermented tea business? Yeah, it should be helpful, but we found that like, yeah, people just... They only buy, like, especially in the UK, it's like they, 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 they buy what they know or if something is a little bit different. And we've just always got to be not too careful to make things too different. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say, again, this kind of depends on your audience a little bit. In Brighton, we get a lot of good reception for this kind of like we've done something interesting to this tea and now it's this other product. We have gone to some events and some other places where we've said, this is tea. And that is not what people think when they think tea, and it's gotten a different reaction. Um, So it really depends on your audience. Some people are really receptive to it, some people are not. (laughs) And what about the tea? Peterson Tea are one of the finalists for the Best Food and Drinks Producer in Wales Award in this year's BBC Food and Farming Awards. Lucy George used to grow soft fruits and make ice cream near Cardiff. Now, she is not only one of the very small number of commercial tea producers in the UK, but she's also making kombucha from the tea she grows. Our judge, Becca Line Perkis, went to visit. Hi, Becca. Hi, Good to meet you. Nice to meet you. That's amazing that, you know, I'm, I'm from Cardiff and this exists just outside. Really, yeah, really close to where I live. So, yeah, uh, this, this is the farm, basically. So, um, yeah, there was literally nothing here uh started tea back in 2000 and late 14 uh-huh. early 15 with seed um the first seed that actually survived was 2016 okay. so it's it's kind of yeah uh, long, it's long process be, it's, uh, yeah i think i've aged more than <laughs> <laughs> for sure in that time i think I, I was a bit flabbergasted when i discovered that you're near Cardiff but you're growing tea I can't quite get it in my head (laughs) no I'm still trying to figure it out as well (laughs) to be be fair yeah (laughs) it's um yeah I think it was I'd grown all sorts of crops before so um yeah I took over the farm in 2002 so I'd grown a lot of fruit um we'd done pick your own we'd had the farm shop so we grew a lot of veg and salad crops and things so I got an idea of effectively what grew well here um what we could market Mm. one of the biggest things for me was we obviously had the ice cream and mainly a fruit-based business Mm. it was very seasonal it was something I wanted to do was to try and stabilize the farm income basically and sort of provide a bit more continuity through through the year um but trying to think of a product that provided that that you could sell year round um from what you could grow is is pretty hard to be mm. fair um and um, when I, I thought of tea it actually ticked most of those boxes mm. um had no idea if it even grew in the uk but i did um sort of quick google search and saw that they were growing it down in cornwall oh, okay. um and a lady taking some cuttings from there up to scotland so uh, that that was my research basically i was just like yeah you can do it <laughs> So kombucha. Oh. Yeah. So this, um, yeah, up until a few weeks back was actually the, the ice cream production uh. room. So we've got the, the five brewing vessels. So we generally have three on the go at a time. So these three are going to be started off later this week. So at the moment we've just got the two mothers. So um, one's black, one's green. Mm-hmm. Um, Peak at the spill. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, not very exciting. There's, um... oh, wow. Just look at that. <sighs> so so um... the kombucha came around because you wanted to utilise more of the waste product from the tea? Pretty yeah. much. Um, also some bad tea making. Because, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I've made some batches that weren't 
weren't really up to, to selling as loose leaf tea. Okay. Um, and yeah, was completely stumped as to what to do with it. Um, and there was a limit to how much tea I could drink myself. Yeah, so. Um, so yeah, broken leaf, whenever we make tea, we have some broken leaf from each batch. Um, but yeah, also any batches that weren't quite up to speed. I really just saw the potential of it, just mm-hmm. adding value to what would otherwise be a waste product. Yeah. And in terms of tea for kombucha, it is it's up there with super stunning tea for kombucha. Yeah. Um, I think people think I'm a bit nuts using that sort of grade for the kombucha, but it gives a better product. Um, and we're now in a position we can actually grow tea specifically for the kombucha. Mm. Uh, we can process it in different ways so that it, it gives us what we need for yeah. the kombucha. And add in the, the flavours to it. This is actually a raspberry and fig leaf batch that's just in at the moment. Yeah. Raspberry, yeah, it's um, it's really just a way for me to have a bit of fun with the fruit that we're, we're growing. So yeah. Our product's unique because we're growing all the tea and we're growing all the fruit that goes in it. I think we're the, the only producers in the UK that are using British tea and certainly our own, our own fruit. So, yeah, it's quite special from that point of view. Lastly, I wanted to get the perspective of someone who's seen kombucha become a massive success in their country. Oh, hi. Thanks so much for having me on. My name is Cara Monson. I'm a food and wine editor and a restaurant critic at the Herald Sun in Melbourne, Australia. As a drinks writer, when did you first notice kombucha kombucha really had a moment or the booch as I like to call it had a bit of a moment uh back in 2015 so that was eight seven eight years ago now and we started to see a bit of a boom back then when uh Australia went through a funny phase and I and I put it down to two reasons Australia was going through a really big Uh, health spurt. Uh, The government was trying to regulate whether uh, people continued to drink uh, soft drinks. And this was uh, a bit of red tape that came in around whether it would be uh, available in hospitals, available at schools. So there was that happening. But then the other thing that happened around that time was we started to see the rise of the Instagram um, influencer and the rise of the Instagram fitness model, which I do think impacted and influenced the way Australia uh, looked after itself. So we were exercising more, we were uh, considerate about what we were eating and I think kombucha really just sort of jumped on the bandwagon around that time and started to, I suppose, see huge popularity. But now I think things have petered off a little bit. Well, why, do, why do you think it has been so much more successful in Australia versus the UK? I do think that there could be... I don't know, in Australia, and 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 arguably I'm sure in the UK, but there's a very active outdoorsy sort of lifestyle. So come summer, people are out, uh, you know, they're riding their bikes, they're running, they're at the gym, they're outside. And I think perhaps there's a bit more of that factoring in. How available is kombucha in, in stores, in local stores? You can get kombucha at any supermarket, I would say, in metropolitan Melbourne. Um, Certainly in all of the capital cities, you'd be able to find kombucha pretty much anywhere. In restaurants and bars, it is available. But what I found has become a bit more of a cool drink to reach for when you don't want a beer and you don't want a wine. As a drinks writer and critic, like what I'm looking for is a delicious drink and something that's going to... Uh, take take me on a journey, um, if you will. And final question to you. Do you think we should welcome a kombucha revolution in the UK? Oh, absolutely. I say if it's delicious enough and they're doing it right, why not? We can do with more delicious drinks in the world. I've been Jager Wise and this episode was produced in Bristol by Sam Grist. <laughs>